Hi everyone, I'm, my name is Chiara and I'm a PhD candidate at the Max Planck Institute for Marine Microbiology in Bremen, uh, that is a city in the north part of Germany close to the North Sea. And in my research, I apply computational methods to explore the dark side of microbial genomes and metagenomes. And today I'm going to tell you about the approach we developed to unify the microbial coding sequence space, which enables to, um, us to study these genes of unknown function. So to fully exploit the potential of microbes and to improve our understanding of microbial systems, we need to start making sense of the large amounts of unknown biology, which characterize around 30% of both microbial genomes and metagenomes. And what is interesting is not much the amount of unknown genes, as much as the incredible diversity that is contained in this unknown fraction. As shown here by these accumulation curves of known and unknown gene clusters as the function of the number of genomes and metagenomes, you see how the unknown curve in red is still far from each saturation and is way above the known curve in green. And this is not all because the unknown fraction keeps growing with the increase in the number of generated genomes and metagenome assembled genomes. And actually, as you can see in the lower panel of this plot, the rate of accumulation of unknown gene clusters is two times faster than the rate of publication of new genomes and metagenome assembled genomes. So now we have a problem when we consider that current analytical methods generally do not include the unknown fraction in their downstream analysis. So this is resulting in our science being based in the best of cases only on half of the available data. So we are losing precious information and we are limiting our understanding of microbial systems. This said, there have been actually several attempts to resolve gene function using different approaches, which include combining biogeochemistry and crystallography, exploring the environmental co-occurrences of gene of a known function together with gene of known function in the samples, or for example, grouping genes into evolutionary related families using a clustering approach, or using remote homology detection methods, and more recently even uh, using deep learning classification methods. All these uh, efforts brought several advances to the field, but many challenges are still remaining. And one of them is the fact that since the first detection, the genes with unknown functions have been defined and described using many, often uh, qualitative, terms that are mostly reflecting the specific purposes of the different studies. So what we are missing is a consensus quantitative and biologically meaningful description of the different unknown levels. In addition to this, we are also missing a standard partitioning scale capable of unifying both genomic and metagenomic data. So in light of these challenges, we um, decide to uh, develop an approach that will enable the inclusion of the genes of unknown function for both genomes and metagenomes in the microbiome functional analysis. And to do that, we started proposing a practical partitioning that unifies the known and unknown space. We started defining four categories that describe the different levels of functional characterization of the coding sequence space and that are valid across organisms and environments. Starting from the known, we define our knowns as uh, uh, those genes with a known function annotated to PFAM domains of known function. And the knowns without PFAM as instead those genes homologous to characterize proteins, but not found in the PFAM database. Then our first category of unknown, the genomic unknowns, uh, includes those genes with an unknown function found in sequenced or draft genomes. So basically all those genes homologous to uh, the hypothetical proteins or uncharacterized proteins that you find in the databases. And in the end, we call environmental unknowns our set of completely uncharacterized genes that are found only in environmental samples. Then based on the same concepts, we want to retrieve a actual structural, structural partition of the coding sequence space capable of unifying known and unknown fractions and to work both for genomes and metagenomes. And to do that, we start working and apply our concepts and develop our approach using a comprehensive set of uh, 2000 marine 
and human microbiome metagenomes, and 29,000 archaea and bacterial genomes that we retrieve from the Genome Taxonomy Database. And um, the combination of these two sets led to uh, around 400 million predicted genes. And now I would like to guide you through the main steps and decision processes that we uh, use to build our approach. Um, I will not include the specific numbers, but I would like to give you some percentages uh, so that you can get a more concrete overview of the process. So to deal with the large amount of predicted genes we had, which uh, actually now is more in the order of billions than millions, um, we decided to apply a sequence clustering approach and to define the gene clusters as our basic partitioning unit. And the gene clusters are actually a great practical solution because they bring together genomes and metagenomes. They work for both known and unknowns. They help reducing the gene data set redundancy, which speed up the downstream analysis. And at the same time, they uh, form um, informative units grouping together uh, evolutionary related genes. However, because of the big numbers uh, we were dealing with, our first clustering attempt for which we use CD8 took three months to cluster 400 million predicted genes down to 30% uh, sequence similarity. So that this uh, left us with no margin of error and no possibility to test or tune the different clustering parameters. But we were lucky because we started working in collaboration with uh, Johannes Sorin group from um, the Max Planck for Biophysical Chemistry in Göttingen. And this team is developing really cool tools that can handle uh, this large amount of data. And thanks to MM6, which is the software developed by Martin Stenegger, which I think is also talking at this conference, uh, we were able to cluster uh, 400 million genes down to 40 uh, million gene cluster in less than one day. So once uh, we finally <laughs> had um, our gene clusters, we filter out the singletons, so basically the cluster with only one member, and we proceeded with the first functional partitioning of our uh, gene cluster space. And to do that, we uh, search the predicted genes against the PFAM database to retrieve for each gene a protein domain architecture, which is basically the order combination of protein domains on the gene. This annotation allow us to identify um, the two sets of annotated around 40% and not annotated 60%, so the majority of uh, gene clusters. Then, since the gene cluster represent our basic fundamental units, we need to ensure that they have a good quality and a good quality in terms of intra-cluster homogeneity. Therefore, we uh, apply a thorough validation step evaluating both the cluster functional annotation homogeneity in terms of domain architectures and their sequence composition homogeneity, identifying non-homologous genes within the gene clusters uh, multiple sequence alignment. We then uh, flagged the gene cluster with too many non-homologous genes as bad quality and we removed them. In addition to this, we also cleaned the gene cluster, identify and removing eventual uh, spurious gene prediction, shadows genes, which are um, the small genes that are found inside the coding interval of larger genes, and the non-homologous genes uh, identified during the validation step. All this uh, quality check and refining uh, process end up removing only 2% of the gene clusters and 3% of the genes, which I think is pointing out that the clustering with MM6 is actually uh, quite accurate. So once we have our set of good quality gene clusters, we proceed with the classification or the partition in the four categories I described before. And to do this, we uh, apply two different strategies. For the annotated gene clusters, we proceed identifying a consensus domain architecture per cluster. This allows us to divide the gene cluster into annotated to domain of known function, the known set, and gene cluster annotated to domain of unknown function, which will become part of the genomic unknown. For the unannotated gene clusters, we wanted to be careful. So since the main uh, purpose of our approach is to provide the best possible representation of the unknown space, we decided to 
gather all our efforts toward finding sequences without any evidence of known homologies. So to, that, to do that, we push the search space beyond the twilight zone of sequence similarity. And what does this mean? So in practice, we started searching our unknown gene clusters using a sensitive two uh, iteration search with MM6 first against a more curated database, which we choose UNIREF90, and then with the non its against the broader um, NCBI and R. And here, I would like to point out that um, all searches return a high percentage of gene clusters homologous to hypothetical proteins, a result that I think is pointing out that the large fraction of uncharacterized proteins stored in public databases. And once we arrive here, we decided to add another step. And we decided to include a remote homology detection to uh, avoid overestimating the number of unknowns. So we searched the HMM profiles of our unknown clusters that were found with no homologies in the previous databases against the UNICLAS database of HMM profiles using HHBlitz, another tool from the sorting group. And HHBlitz allows to um, search uh, profile against profiles in a very fast and sensitive way. And this type of search searches allows to go beyond the twilight zone uh, of a sequence similarity, which is set around 20%. And to emphasize how important this step was for us, we uh, identified uh, remote homologies in UNICLASS for more than 60% of the gene cluster that were found with no homologies in the previous two searches. In the end, the gene clusters um, were partitioned in the four categories. So basically, we retrieve our known sets of the cluster annotated to um, known domain architectures, then uh, the known without PFAM as those clusters annotated to the characterized proteins in the searches databases, then uh, the genomic unknowns annotated to hypothetical proteins or PFAM domain of unknown function, and then the environmental unknowns, the set uh, that was found with no homologies in all the search databases. And here, I would actually like to uh, say or clarify that we are not actually providing annotations for our gene clusters. So we believe that annotation should be a careful process supported by experimental evidence. So we use this uh, classification step just to um, partition our gene clusters into the four categories. Then we actually decided to add another layer and to investigate the eventual um, remote homologies shared between gene clusters. And based on this information, we aggregate our clusters into what we call communities. And this step allows us to complete the partitioning scale of the coding sequence space that goes from the genes to the gene cluster communities and that allow us to perform analysis at different levels. So, from one side, we can perform fine grained analysis, exploiting the um, genes associations inside the gene clusters. And for more coarse grained analysis, instead, we can use the groups of gene clusters based on their remote homologies. And all these steps I just described contribute to build Agnostos, our computational workflow, uh, together with a rich contextualization of the gene cluster, which we carried out gathering the phylogenetic and ecological data that we can retrieve usually from genomic and metagenomic data sets. We also perform some uh, taxonomic annotation and we search additional uh, databases of both protein structural data, such as the dark proteome database and experimental data as the data set of mutant phenotypes from uh, Price and colleagues of 2018. And all these features that we uh, combined together to create agnostos allow us to integrate it transparently into the traditional analytical workflows. And this time allow the inclusion of the unknown fraction in the downstream functional analysis of genomes and metagenomes. Additionally, a really key important feature of agnostos, uh, especially considering the production rate of new sequence data is scalability or basically um, the possibility to provide a seed database that can be integrated and expanded with new genomic and metagenomic data sets. 
So this leads from one side to the enrichment of the diversity and uh, the content of the existing gene clusters, and from the other side allows to maximize the information that you can retrieve for the new sequences that uh, were integrated. So overall, Agnostos provide a quite comprehensive analytical environment to partition and explore the coding sequence space. And in this schematic representation, uh, I report the different, metro, uh, the different modules that uh, Agnostos offers to investigate the coding sequence space of genomes and metagenomes at different, uh, say, depth levels. You can start from the surface, and if you want to get a first overview of what could be inside your metagenomic or genomic data set, you can perform a profile search using your amino acid sequences against the Agnostos um, gene cluster profiles. This will return the classification of your sequences in the four categories according to the uh, homologies to the search gene clusters. Then, um, if you want to go a bit deeper, you can use the database creation module and to partition and characterize your genomic or metagenomic data set, creating a curated gene cluster database. And in the end, if you want to maximize the information retrievable for your data set, you can decide to integrate your sequences into an existing Agnostos gene cluster database using this uh, database update module. And for this, the existing gene cluster can be the seed that is actually provided by default uh, for the workflow or any other gene cluster database created using the database creation module. And from here, you will get as output an integrated database of richly characterized and contextualized gene clusters. And actually, this is not all, because recently, in collaboration with Marin and Matthew Schechter from the University of Chicago, we are implementing the possibility to integrate and visualize the output of Agnostos into Ambio. Um, Ambio is an open source analysis and visualization platform for microbial omics. And this new implementation will allow you to take the output from the database update module. So from basically the integration of your metagenomic or genomic sequences into Agnostos and to directly add it into the Anvio uh, Word and Anvio database as functional additional data as shown uh, in the command line here. And this will allow you to explore, for instance, the proportion of agnostic gene cluster categories within the splits of metagenomic pins, or to investigate the distribution of known and unknown gene clusters in a pangenome. Uh, I, this implementation is almost ready, and I think it will be out with the new release of Ampio. And here, I am done with the development part, and I would like to show you some of the applications of Agnostos. We initially applied our approach to about 2,000 metagenomes and 29,000 prokaryotic genomes, which resulted in a curated set of more than 5 million good quality gene clusters with more than one member and 600,000 communities, which we used to perform an in-depth exploration of the unknown space under both an ecological and genomic perspective. And here I reported a selection of the main results. So from the ecological side, we um, investigated the occurrence patterns of the gene clusters in the metagenomes uh, to identify cluster with a narrow distribution, so basically present only in specific samples with high abundance, or broad distribution, almost ubiquitous clusters, basically. Uh, we did this using the Levin's niche breadth index. And what we observed is that the unknown fraction present mainly a narrow distribution. And this is suggesting an adaptive and environmentally related potential. However, we also observe a pool of broadly distributed unknowns, and particularly a pool of broadly distributed environmental unknowns, which uh, suggests the existence of potential ubiquitous organism left completely uncharacterized by traditional approaches. From the aspiration instead of the coding sequence space in a genomic context, we observe that the unknown fraction is predominantly linear specific at the genomes and species level, as shown here uh, on the plot on the left. In general, let's say like a cluster is linear specific when 
we can detect homologous only in a limited group of related clades. So the unknown's linear specificity at species and genus level combined with the environmental distribution analysis indicates a possible role for these clusters in microbial clade diversification and niche adaptation processes. And indeed, these linear specific uh, unknowns constitute a really interesting um, analysis target for identifying putative clade defining functions and to get insights into poorly characterized groups such as uh, candidate pateshi bacteria uh, within the candidate phyla radiation, which, as you can see in this bubble plot here on the right, is the film we found mostly enriched in unknowns, and for which we retrieve more than 200,000 linear specific genes of unknown function, which represent a really good starting point to um, deepen our understanding of this microorganism unusual biology. Then we also test our approach in combination with experimental data. For this, we use, uh, as I said, the experiments of Price et al, where they provide mutant phenotypes for 1,000 bacteria of unknown function, 1,000 bacteria genes of unknown function. And we selected the experiment comparing the fitness values for Pseudomonas florences in a plain rich medium and in rich medium with added spectinomycin. Uh, spectinomycin is an antibiotic that uh, inhibits and protein synthesis and elongation by binding the um, bacterial ribosoma subunit 30S. Within this experiment, we identify a gene of unknown function with a strong effect on the bacterium fitness. And this gene corresponds to one of our genomic unknowns. Uh, to clarify the fitness values of a gene describe um, the change in the abundance of the bacterium uh, of the mutants in the gene during the experiment. And a fitness below zero, like in this case, implies that the gene was important for the bacterium growth and the mutants are less abundant. So this indicates that this unknown is actually helped in uh, pseudomonas to grow in the presence of the antibiotic. To deepen the investigation, we decided to retrieve all the genomes belonging to these gene clusters and these remote homologous in the community. And we explore the genomic neighborhoods. And from this, we found that the gene order around this gene cluster is highly conserved. And we found the gene cluster always after the RPSF, RPSR operon, which encode exactly for the 30S ribosomal protein, the prime target of spectinomycin. Therefore, this evidence provides a strong support to generate a hypothesis that this unknown might be actually involved in the resist resistance to the antibiotic. And also show how agnostos can be used to augment experimental methods. From this first application of our approach, uh, we saw that unifying the known and unknown space allows the investigation of the unknown fraction across both environments and organisms. And also that uh, broadly contextualized unknown space facilitate the identification of uh, targets for experimental characterization. Okay, I now would like to show you some other, maybe more practical application of agnostos. And uh, the first one involved the usage of agnostos gene clusters to identify contaminants in metagenome assembled genomes. And with contaminants, I mean uh, chimeric contigs or contigs belonging to uh, different phylogenetic groups compared to um, the rest of the genome. But why contamination? Why it's important? So uh, in the past few years, we had an explosion in the generation of MAC collections, which uh, in my opinion is great because they have revealed new perspective on the evolution of life and especially because they represent an invaluable resource to provide genomic context to the pool of uncharacterized genes that are coming from metagenomes. However, these mugs can contain contaminants due to errors in the reconstruction processes. So since they are being collected as references in databases like GTDB or the NCBI, this eventual contamination will lead to misleading uh, evolutionary or ecological insights. In addition to this, the existing methods to evaluate MAC's quality are um, essentially based on single copy core genes. And therefore, they fail to detect contaminants in case these targets are not present or these uh, genes are different from the one that we uh, have at the moment in the existing lists. 
So uh, we decided in collaboration with Tom Delmont, um, a genoscope, Marin and Martin Stenegger, to uh, develop an approach that uh, use the information store in diagnostic gene cluster to evaluate the contact taxonomic composition. And this is still work in progress, but I would like to show you briefly more uh, the method and then uh, also some preliminary results. So um, first, we annotate the genes inside a gene cluster using a comprehensive taxonomy that is covering all domains of life and the viruses. Then for each gene cluster, we build a taxonomy graph, basically uh, using the taxonomy path of the genes and weighting the edges by the number of annotated genes per path. Then we take this gene cluster graph and we integrate it into the ground taxonomy graph that is coming from um, the database used for the annotation. And this integration allow us to calculate the overlap of our gene cluster graph of the over, on the overall taxonomy. And with this, we estimate um, how conserved is the gene cluster in the overall taxonomy. We repeat this operation for all gene clusters in a contig. And at the end, for each conti, we uh, calculate the weighted union graph, which we use to compare the different contig inside a genome uh, using uh, graph kernel algorithms, which are simply algorithms that are used to uh, calculate similarities between pairs of graphs. Once we get the similarities, we plot them in an ordination plot, we identify the centroid and eventual outliers, which represent our problematic context that need further investigation. And here I have uh, one example. We are testing uh, this approach on the set of mugs from uh, Pasoli et al. in 2019. Uh, these are mugs from the human microbiome. Um, this particular mug was reported having 75% completion and 1.76 redundancy, so medium quality. And this mug was also manually curated using the Ambio Metagenomic workflow, which identified 25% of its contigs as contaminated. And all these contigs identified as contaminated were found lacking single COVID core genes. The four, they represent uh, one of these cases of challenging contamination to, to be detected. And as we report in this table here on the right, our approach uh, show high agreement with the model creation. And we were actually able to identify 86% of the manually uh, removed contigs as problematic. So this proved that our approach is able to deal also with these complicated cases of silent contaminants where we don't have single copy core genes. And yeah, it's quite promising, <laughs> but it's still work in progress. And the general idea would be not to uh, provide, um, to identify and remove the contaminated contents, but more to provide a guide, uh, a guidance system for uh, the manual curation. Okay, in the next application, I would then like to show you how we can uh, leverage the possibility to expand Agnostos database to other domains of life and the possibility to exploit the full coding sequence space to deepen uh, our understanding of poorly characterized groups. We uh, recently expanded the SEED database integrating the genomes of two understudy groups. Uh, we first, uh, added 3,000 um, reference and environmental genomes of nucleocytoplasmatic large DNA viruses, so uh, basically giant viruses, and then 700 uh, eukaryotic single amplified genomes and metagenome assembled genomes that we can call together as MUGs, recently published by Delmont uh, and colleagues. And in the study of Delmont et al. These eukaryotic marks were used to provide a first genome-wide functional classification of the abundant lineages of unicellular eukaryotic plankton. And this functional landscape was initially based on the functionally annotated fraction only, which was using less than half of the data set. The integration of the full gene set into Agnostos allowed to use 45% more genes for this purpose. 
And even more interesting, the functional landscape retrieved using only the unknown gene clusters shows overall the same trends. So this indicates that the unknowns are such an important compartment of genomes that they contain sufficient information to recapitulate the overall signal. And finally, the last uh, work in progress application aims at the identification of novel biosynthetic gene clusters. Uh, these biosynthetic gene clusters are groups of metabolic genes located close to each other in a genome, which uh, are usually, um, whose expression is usually co-regulated, and that encode for what we call secondary metabolites, which are antibiotics, anti-tumoral agents, and other products with medical, industrial, or uh, biotechnological relevance. So in collaboration with Marnix Medema from the University of Wageningen in uh, the Netherlands, Marin and Matthew from Chicago, we are developing an approach to identify uh, new potential biosynthetic gene clusters that use the integration of Biosynthetic cluster into agnostos in combination with the analysis of uh, biosynthetic cluster similarity networks in ferret using Bigscape and a pangenome aspiration enabled by Anvio. And we have already integrated the biosynthetic cluster in the MyBig database into agnostos, and we identify a quite large proportion of biosynthetic cluster enriched with our cluster of unknown function. And here, in this uh, similarity network, they are represented by the yellow circles. So the idea now is to start using these unknown gene clusters to screen the metagenome assembly genomes, genomes, or even pangenomes, and to find synthetic genomic regions that could be uh, potential new biosynthetic gene clusters. So in conclusion, with these applications, we are showing how Agnostos is providing the theoretical and computational basis to study uh, the large pool of genes with an unknown function, and how he enables the inclusion of these genes into ecological, evolutionary, and biotechnological applications. We also show that uh, Agnostos is enabling the uh, usage of the full set of genes in a genome or a metagenomes, and this will hopefully lead us to a broader understanding of microbial systems. I would like to close then with some links um, in case you want to play with Agnostos yourself. So you can download it as a SnakeMake workflow from GitHub using the link here on the upper left part of the slide. And the Agnostos databases are also available for download from Figshare. Here below, I reported the link of, uh, for uh, the seed database and also the link to a test database that uh, can be used to quickly test the workflow. And then uh, if you're really interested, and <laughs> if you want to go more into uh, details, you can visit our website at dark.metagenomics.eu, where you can find a detailed description of the methods used in each workflow steps and the results of the exploration of the unknown fraction of uh, genomes and metagenomes presented in uh, our preprint and here as a first application. And with this, I would like to conclude and to thank especially uh, Antonio fernandez Guerra, who is the main mind behind Agnostos and that co-developed with me the approach. And of course, Professor Glockner for giving me the possibility to do my uh, PhD at the Max Planck Institute here in Bremen. And then uh, Matt, Tom, Pierre, and Marin for the constant support and help in developing Agnostos and the various applications, and all the other colleagues uh, and friends that contributed to this project. And of course, I would also like to thank the uh, Bioinformatic Virtual Coordination Network for inviting me to present my work at this conference.